Philadelphia Execution, A True Story of Murder and American Justice by Dave Emmy. Introduction This book is based upon a true story regarding events that happened to me over the course of a week. I wrote it because I felt compelled to do so. It was as if these events affected me with the same power that affected the people who made up the basis of the story of violence and loss. In a way, I became intertwined in the story's plotline and ended up being pivotal to its resolution. I started doc to document these events as quickly as possible so my recollection would be as accurate as I could make it. Considering that these events happened to the author, there is an innate bias in these writings. I did my best to limit these biases as much as my discernment allowed, although I'm certain that some still crept in. I utilized the assistance of a voice recognition software in recording the story to facilitate its creation upon the written page. Names and events have been changed, and at a few points I've taken some mild literary license, primarily as a means to illustrate my mindset. All major elements of the story are as factual as I can recollect them to be. I was prompted to write the story because I felt it was unique, dramatic, emotionally charged, and relevant to a segment of life in America today. One of the things I took away from these events was an authentic feeling of the American experience with all its good and bad. It is a tale with elements that in many ways have been played out over time and time again in our nation's history. There is a sense of familiar security and a sense of fatalistic sadness in it. I could not help but to wonder why our society has not been able to retain all the positive aspects of an experience like this while moving forward to eradicate the social failures that are so often repeated and poignantly illustrated in this story. I have no quick answer to this complex question. Events like the one described here happen every day in America, but there are unique circumstances surrounding this instance and my specific role and involvement in it that I felt were extraordinary and worthy of documenting. This is a first-person account, but I also wanted to share with the reader my personal thoughts and feelings while this tremendous emotional experience unfolded. If describing this event helps others to avoid a similar circumstance, or in some minor way prods our society to move forward toward in moving improving efforts to remedy these matters, my hope for positive tangible results from this experience will be realized. Chapter 1 The families of the victim and the defendant were led from the courtroom minutes before the autopsy photos were being distributed to us in the jury box. These captionless stark images were somehow infused with an exceptional powerful force to mute everyone and everything around them. The eight photos were enlarged, and before they reached me as juror number three, I could see the piercing blue, brown, and red colors emanating from the prints. When I held them upon closer examination, they seemed almost surreal to me. I've seen gory autopsy photos of corpses before, but these were enlarged, vibrant, graphic, and vivid photos of the 19-year-old black male victim, Stephen Smith, on the medical examiner's autopsy table. Seven of the eight photos were close-ups of Stephen Smith's head, where two point-blank gunshot wounds terminated his life just 18 months prior. The other photograph was of his right hand, where a bullet had torn through the knuckle region of his index finger before ripping an approximate three-inch gash through the right portion of his scalp. This head wound started about midway on the right side of Stephen's forehead and continued past his hairline before glancing off of his skull. The medical examiner needed to shave a portion of his hair to fully expose the wound. The bullet that caused these wounds was never recovered, only bullet fragments. After the bullet slashed through his scalp, it likely disintegrated against the pavement or the concrete siding of a row house nearby. The second bullet entered Stephen's head just below the corner of his left eye, 
between his temple and eyebrow. This bullet entry wound was no larger than the bullet itself. It almost looked like a thin cut next to his closed left eye. This round did its fatal damage in Stephen's skull and was lodged there when his body was recovered. It traveled almost directly through his head in a downward diagonal path and was removed just behind the base of his right ear. The visual dichotomies in the photos were both striking and sickening simultaneously. On the one hand, there was a fresh-looking, healthy, young adult male. He had no skin wrinkles or gray hairs or any signs of age. Although his eyes were closed, there was a boisterous, exuberant, youthful quality about his facial features. At the same time, there was a bloody red gash that ripped through the right, his right forehead, and a portion of his hairline was shaved back in a manner only typified by medical intervention. There were bright red blood drops on the white bed sheet on the autopsy table beside his head. The excited promise of a youthful life was being dissected on the same stainless steel table as a gruesome bloody murder victim, and the contrasts were both prominent and wrenched my stomach. This whole story starts with my having an extended vacation from the corporate environment that I had toiled in for the past 10 years. A vacation may not be the most accurate term because I accepted a severance package from my previous employer and was working toward a career change. Although I wasn't working the 9 to 5 corporate environment, I was actively engaged in writing a book that bridged the link between computer information systems, genetics, and psychology. I also have a home music recording studio, and I was recording a backlog of material that I had written and never had the chance to finalize. I was no longer awakening to an alarm clock, a shower, a business attire, and rush hour, but I was up and about at about 8 a.m., working most nights on these projects well past midnight. At this time, I received a letter from my county requesting that I appear for jury duty. Up to this point, I had successfully dodged this civil obligation. I'm no anarchist, and I see a vital role for government and law and order in a civilized society. But by and large, I saw the American political and criminal justice systems as in need of reform. The original tenets they were founded upon, I believe, were noble, but I also believed corruption and self-serving agendas had left us with a system that poorly serves its citizenry, and I was not optimistic about this system's future. Therefore, I was against donating my valuable time to participate in a process that I felt had become fundamentally flawed. That said, I had read somewhere in a self-help newspaper column that one should try to serve on a jury sometime in their life. The article expressed a sentiment that participating in this activity would help establish a new knowledge and respect for civic duty and responsible citizenship. Having recently seen a few nationally televised high-profile criminal cases, a pedestrian interest in our criminal justice system was also sparked in me. Additionally, I know a number of attorneys, and we often talk about the dynamics of noteworthy cases. Considering that I was now working on my own schedule, I thought it might be a good time for me to attempt to participate. I developed my own ideas about our criminal justice system and thought that this would give me a perfect opportunity to examine my beliefs in the light of an actual experience. 